Following this talk, there'll be an opportunity to ask Dr. Lepala questions. So please submit your questions throughout the talk uh, at any time through the chat function, and I will collate those questions and put them to Dr. Lepala on your behalf uh, following her presentation. I'm delighted to introduce our speaker this evening. Dr. Lepala became a member of Lucy Cavendish College in 2011 and completed her PhD in physics at the Cavendish Laboratory in 2015. Shortly after, she worked in the Department of Theoretical Chemistry as a Newton Trust Fellow, after which she moved to uh, New Mexico, where she worked at Los Alamos National Laboratory as a postdoctoral center for nonlinear studies research fellow. At Los Alamos, Dr. Lapala worked on the largest biomolecular simulation to date, which is a billion atom simulation of an entire gene and came up with a data driven algorithm to model entire chromosomes and genomes. Dr. Lapala is currently an instructor in investigation at Harvard University and Massachusetts General Hospital and an associate of the physics department. Uh, Dr. Lapala, we look forward to your talk. Thank you so much, Amir, for a beautiful introduction. Um, well, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Anna. And, uh, you know, first I want to start talking about my career path. And after that, I will talk a little bit more uh, in detail uh, what my research entails. So um, let me share my screen. So the title of my talk is A Nonlinear Career Path from Ballet to Physics. So this is how it all started. Uh, in this photograph, you can see me. Uh, I started dancing when I was four, and I thought that you know my calling was to be a ballerina. Um, I uh, exercised <laughs> at least six hours a day. It was really intense training. I went for two. Um, onto a national ballet school in, in Finland, where I lived at the time. Then I moved to Germany to live uh, on my own um, without my loving parents, because I decided that I wanted to study ballet more in, intensely uh, in Europe. And so afterwards, what happened was that I realized that the all the work was a little bit too much for my back and uh, Unfortunately, unfortunately, I couldn't um, dance anymore. And at that point, I was I was lost. I didn't really know what to do uh, in terms of career, and I was only fifteen. So I felt like something needs to be done, and I decided, well, what was it that, as a child, I was interested in, and I realized that I really liked constructing things. I used to play with cars a lot. And I decided that one of the main interests is really to find patterns, not just in nature, but also I started, I was really interested in computers as a child. And I realized that something that really uh, would be my path would be would have to do with computers. So that was a really intense transition from you know physical exercise, ballet, and this artistic um, idea of who you want to be uh, to a different way of life and different way of thinking. But I realized that this is something that came naturally. And so I decided that a career in academia would probably be the best solution. And this is how a life in academia is for us. And this is a scene <laughs> from a kickboxing competition here at Cambridge. So when I was a student, a PhD student at Cambridge, um, I used to be part of the team. In the beginning, it was just part of the team, the kickboxing team. And eventually I became the uh, president of the kickboxing society. And I advocated for women to 
get prizes the way um, men did. And so men uh, usually were awarded half blues in kickboxing uh, at Cambridge uh, as they competed with uh, Oxford University and if they won. So I was advocating for two years. It was uh, two years of intense meetings trying to convince people that women deserve the same treatment. And effectively, um, my team uh, got awarded, uh, a lot of the ladies on my team got awarded half blues, including me. And this is just an example of, of one of the fights with a girl, which I actually lost, uh, but I thought this was a, uh, a funny shot. So, you know, academia is, is almost like kickboxing. There are many times where you feel that you are struggling and that the path is not really straightforward. But you have to really realize that you have to get up and keep on going. So, you know, patterns, I, I mentioned patterns, and that was something that drew me to physics to begin with. And so this is Vasily Kandinsky, Kandinsky's painting. And so here you're looking at the, the combination of beautiful colors and patterns that he just imagined in his mind's eye. He had this condition called synesthesia. And I read about him as a child and I loved his paintings. So I decided, you know, how does this condition come about? So here is, let me see if I can show you this slide first. Okay, so synesthesia is a condition of mixing of senses. So what, happened, what, what happens in the brain of a synesthete is that they see colors as they imagine letters, for example. So this is an example of a synesthete's alphabet where, you know, A is colored red, B is colored uh, yellow, and so on. And even some months could be colored differently. So January in white, and this is how they see it. This is how they imagine it. Some people have more complex ideas of what they interpret as, as a number, for example. And one of my friends at Cambridge, um, she told me that she had this condition also. And, and she saw the letter H as being furry and gray. And this is a very interesting phenomenon from the scientific perspective, because we don't know much about it. What we know is that somehow the brain of a synesthete is wired differently. And so this was something that caught my attention when I was in high school. And I wrote this uh, little essay uh, called Synesthesia, Colorful Mind. I started working in a lab uh, and doing electroencephalogram experiments where I comparatively studied participants who had you know, a regular perception of, of different senses. And these people with synesthesia, a condition that causes this mixing of wiring in your brain. And as a result, you start seeing letters as colors, sounds as shapes, even pain sometimes can be associated with some very complex topological structures that you observe first before you even feel the pain. And so, you know, as a 16 year old, I started really becoming obsessed with this condition. And I found a number of people uh, from, you know, about my age who had the condition and I decided to study them. It was something that kind of came spontaneously. I talked to a professor at the University of Technology in Helsinki uh, in Finland, where I lived at the time after her talk. And she said, well, you know, if you manage to write a research proposal, then perhaps you can do some experiments. And so that's what I did. And a week later, I sent her an email saying, this is my research proposal and, and this is what I want to do. She was really excited about it. And uh, 
she started helping me with the experimental setup and then i went on to individually do uh these exciting experiments and funnily enough what i found back then was that it's not the visual part of the brain that actually responds to the stimulus it's rather the part of the brain that's representative of emotion and cognitive processes that are actually in your prefrontal cortex uh, on the front part of your brain rather than the back where the visual cortex is. Uh, and, and so it turns out that, you know, as it happens, the wiring is changed and different not in the back of your head, but in the front. And so I was really excited about these results and I continued this work. And, and I think about two years later, because I never, never actually published this study as a, as a high school kid, you know, I didn't know what a publication was, but I found out that somebody had actually worked on it, a, a scientist had worked on it and I contacted him and we, uh, went to a conference and discussed this in in great detail and they found out that in fact this is what they also see in their experiments so i was really excited and you know this was the first step that i realized that science is something that i want to do in my life this is a letter that really brings me a lot of joy and i was really glad that i found it yesterday to share with you this is a letter that I received a long time ago now from somebody who worked uh, at Cambridge, uh, at the LMB in Cambridge, and she invited me to work in her lab over the summer. And this was the first time when I had any contact with Cambridge and molecular biology. I was so excited that you know that that meant everything to me so i worked really hard and got a lot of results this is an example of of some of my work um with uh, with gels and and some fragmentation of of dna so here you're looking at some dna fragments and and as they're running through through the gel you can see the size of the fragment depending of, on how long the fragment had run and this had nothing to do with the condition of synesthesia but what i really realized at that point was that i want to go deeper i want to understand how the brain works but not only how the brain works i want to really understand how molecules come together to form the brain and when i started thinking about it even as i was working in a molecular bi biology lab I suddenly realized that, you know, molecular biology tells you a lot and it's a, it's a very complicated way of, of understanding molecular mechanisms. But what's kind of behind that is the physics, is the chemistry. And that's where I realized that, you know, I really needed to focus on courses in mathematics and physics. To, to try to interpret what's really happening in these gels. What, 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 what are the molecules that we're talking about? What do they do and how do they behave? How do they move around in, inside a cell? And I was really excited about this. And, uh, you know, from 2009, uh, I was absolutely obsessed. I started reading all the literature there was, and I, I started seeing that there are some experiments that could potentially lead to a structural representation of the chromosome. And so I was at the time I was an undergraduate. So, you know, I couldn't really write papers or uh, didn't have much time to work on on other things other than uh, my studies, but I still started thinking about structural representations and 3D models of, chrom of the chromosome. So this, there's a story behind this and there's a reason why the X chromosome. So when I uh, was a child, um, 
So let, let's 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 start with um, how chromosomes are in general. So in females, you typically find two X chromosomes, and in males, you find one X chromosome and one Y chromosome. So sometimes what can happen is that a female, uh, as the embryo develops, actually only gets one X chromosome from one of the parents. And so you end up having one X chromosome. And this is the condition, uh, this is a condition called Turner syndrome. And that's what I have. So in, in my cells, instead of having two X chromosomes, I only have one. And interestingly enough, what happens in, in most females is that as you develop, spontaneously, one of your X chromosomes becomes inactive. So it kind of folds away into a really tightly packed kind of block of noodles. And it just is stored away and almost none of the genes are active, which is what is happening in, in my case, what happens is that my one X chromosome is constantly active. And so there's no inactive counterpart. Um, so, you know, I was really excited about the X chromosome, trying to understand how it works. Um, and I started with the basic physics. And this is, this is something that um, I came across in, uh, in Cambridge. So as a PhD student, I worked with Eugene Terentiev of uh, Queens College we worked on a problem called the, called the coil globule transition. And this is a transition that takes place in polymers. And what we were looking at is linear polymer chains that collapse and kind of fold onto themselves. And this was exciting for me because I kind of saw it as a way to understand chromosomes. And, and different proteins too. So as a postdoc later on, when I moved to America and started, started uh, my job at Los Alamos National Lab, I realized that I can use all the information that I got from modeling the polymer chain. So these long noodle-like molecules that are folding, um, I can use that information and use that to represent chromosome structures. And the way to do that was to combine some experimental data with, with the modeling that I already knew. And so that was the connection that I made at the time. And uh, that was a really interesting transformation that led to uh, a number of publications and it was really exciting to me. So here I'm going to show you a brief movie of how this process called X chromosome inactivation takes place. And this is all based on modeling experimental data. So in white, you're seeing the structure of a chromosome and in red, you're looking at some RNA particles that are bound to the chromosome. And in green are some RNA particles that are kind of floating around uh, before they are bound to the chromosome. And so we're looking at this event called spreading of the RNA. And this spreading of the RNA eventually folds the entire chromosome. So let me play the video here. So all this dramatic video showed was this 
this part of, of the process where you start off as an active X chromosome and then this RNA kind of swarms around engulfing the entire chromosome and this collapses and folds the chromosome and as you become inactive most of the genes are actually turned off so what we realize now is that there is a uh, there is an interplay between structure and function and and uh, this is something interesting in uh for example not only in the x chromosome this happens in 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 many different chromosomes as your gene needs to be more active this gene also needs to kind of open up and and not be folded away from the transcription machinery and so this is important in say cancer development where often what starts happening is that your genes become really just erratically uh, active and as a result you start seeing structures that are not consistent with you know a very nicely folded chromosome shape that you would expect and that leads to to all kinds of problems so the I just want to briefly describe this experiment to you and this is this was published in 2009 and I still remember as a student in Edinburgh at the time I was an undergraduate there I saw this paper and I was absolutely fascinated because that was the moment when I knew that I will eventually be able to build a 3D structure of the chromosome. At the time, of course, I didn't know how to do it. I didn't have the skills, uh, didn't know enough to, to make that happen. But several years later, in fact, 10 years later, um, this is what we did. And so the experiment is very, very uh, beautiful. You simply take and cross-link the, the, the DNA of many, many different cells. So you have hundreds of thousands of cells and you cross link, um, which means that you take and put together pieces of DNA that are already close in space. And so now you have regions that are con in, co in close proximity contacting each other. And so then you take and you cut that part out and you then fill these, uh, the, the ends of the structure with a specific protein called biotin. And then you put these things together into a ring. Then you purify this DNA, you use that protein to uh, pull, the, uh, pull it down. And as a result, you can sequence the DNA. And so you have all the information that's needed of the entire genome that that you can then look at as these uh, beautiful contact maps uh, as we call them so this is a contact map of chromosome 14. so this uh, main diagonal here represents self-contacts and these are non-trivial contacts that you see as a result of these very complex interaction interactions that that form the structure of the chromosome so the method that I came up with uh, is, is really quite simple. You start off with the initial configuration of self-avoiding random walk. And this is just meaning that you know, your particles are placed in a way that your chain cannot cross itself. Then you take the experimental data and you directly use that to constrain your structure. And so you use these experimental points to identify which points need to be close in your 3D structure. Then you run some Brownian dynamic simulations um, based on that data and you get a 3D structure out. Then what you can do, of course, is compute a profile of connectivity for this 3D structure and compare that with the experimental structure. And in this case, these are 90% or even higher uh, identical. So the way this model works is really, it's really based on simple physical ideas. And, and these were not developed by me. They were, these ideas were developed a long time ago and I used them 
to start working out what the structure of the chromosome is. So some basic model parameters are that you have consecutive beads that are just connected by a string. And then there are interactions that are kind of spatial interactions uh, related to distance. So if you come close, you start repelling. And if you are far away, you actually start kind of wanting to get closer. And then there's another interaction that just sets the stiffness of the chain and that's between three consecutive beads. And so this is the main idea. And then as a result, you get something like this. So here, the red beads want to interact, the pink beads want to interact, and the green ones also want to interact. So you get a structure that looks like this, but of course, this is all very dynamic and over time it can change, satisfying, still satisfying all the constraints that I just mentioned. So this is the basic idea of how we use the experimental data to come up with these chromosome models. And here I'm showing the same chromosome. This is the active X chromosome in its active form. And the two ends here are colored differently. And there's a specific gene that's kind of known to be in the middle of the chromosome. And that's what we also see um, in the models. So, you know, you may ask, what is this good for? And the answer is for many things. So for example, uh, from experiments alone, you really can't know how much the volume of the chromosome changes or how the surface area as you kind of become inactive as the next chromosome, how does it evolve over time? So I work closely with Jeannie Lee at Harvard who uh, has the data to look at exactly that. So we use her data uh, and, and we build structural models from which we can then get all this information. You can also look at where certain genes are located on the chromosome. And so for example, here I'm showing some genes that happen um, to escape the process of X inactivation. And so here in green are these uh, genes, for example, exist, JPX, uh, fire. And what we noticed is that these genes are often on the surface of the chromosome. And, and they're also clustered on the surface of the chromosome into several clusters. And so this is something that partially was known before, but this clustering is something that we really could only find through modeling the 3D structure. You can also look at how the chromosome behaves over time in terms of you know, motions of different parts of the chromosome. And so here you're looking at this plot where uh, what I'm showing is displacement of different parts of the chromosome. For example, the core here from the center all the way to the surface here. And so you see that the core is actually moving much less uh, compared to the surface. And so what happens is that you have a high density core, and then you kind of have this region where your genes are not moving as much. And so in the core, genes are mostly inactive. And then on the surface, you start getting active genes. And again, this is something that is extremely relevant to uh, processes in, in cancer, for example, where things start going wrong and you start having parts of the chromosome that are supposed to be in the core go outside in the surface and then some of the genes get expressed. And so this is what we can really see and look into when we uh, build these 3D models. So something that um, we're currently working on is uh, called the genome browser. 4D genome browser, and, and uh, it's a collaboration between Harvard and Los Alamos National Lab. Uh, uh, in particular, uh, Carissa Sanbonmatsu's lab um, and David Rogers, who, who developed uh, this interface where anyone working on this type of data can uh, use their experimental results to turn them into 3D structures. And I was amazed at how 
this simple idea that I had at the time, you know, developed into something much larger that is now becoming reality. And that's now really becoming something that other people can use. So what you could, what you are seeing here is a, is somebody manipulating the structure to look at particular genes or particular chromosome segments. And here you have the active X chromosome of a mouse, of a female mouse, and then uh, the inactive X chromosome of a mouse. And you see that there's some similarity, uh, but also a lot of differences. And I'm not going to go into the detail, but basically what you can do is you can go and look at different uh, say epigenetic uh, changes and so on to be able to tell what's really happening to the structure as something is changed in the genome. So, you know, what I work on is not just chromosomes. We do other cool stuff and uh, for example, uh, something that we started working on recently is um, the dynamic of knots. Uh, and we realized that, you know, if we just kind of think of a knot, uh, in this case, prime knots is what we're looking at. Um, if we think of these knots as simple chains, we start seeing these interesting kind of almost periodic motions. And, and so I, I became excited about this and, and realized that, you know, I can, I can look at these different structures of knots of different complexities. So by complexity, what I mean is that, you know, you have more crossings in this knot than this knot. Here you only have three crossings, here you have eight. Um, so you can see that the motions of this knot and this knot are very different. This one is kind of free to move wherever it wants to move, but this one is already starting to be constrained. And this is just the result of topology. Just the fact that it is kind of winding as a wire uh, the way it is. And now if you look at an even more um, complex knot, you start seeing that it simply does not move because it's wound up so much that you just can't really force it to go anywhere. And so it becomes really stable. And so what we call this jamming, a jamming transition in physics. And, and it's something that we noticed for the first time. And I don't think that there is um, any other uh, data out there that shows the same. So I was really excited when we saw something completely new um, that is purely, you know, topology induced and not something else. Um, of course, you can also, this is almost the end of my uh, presentation. So you can also do other things and, and something that I work with, uh, uh, I work on with a collaborator from Harvard, Maha, uh, and his postdocs uh, is the bird's nest problem. So what they realized is that you know you can study uh, birds nests and how how they become so stable by just looking at metal rods and so they did a, a whole bunch of experiments where they are compressing and expanding these rods and uh, what we realized also is that we can run simulations that would do exactly the same so here is a probably a better example where you see that as you compress it in one axis here, then some of the rods start sliding. And what we, what we noticed from these simulations is that it's a collective effect. So you collectively start rearranging these different structures so that the, the end product becomes much more stable. And this is what birds do by constantly sitting on their nest and rearranging the little rods or the, the little branches that are present in, in that structure. So then uh, we, we also look at other things like sea fan dynamics. And this is again, something that you can look at in simulation. So here it's a slightly more complicated thing where we use hydrodynamics 
Um, and here you're looking at a branched C fan and then some nutrients that kind of come across. And what we're looking at is, you know, how would these nutrients bind depending on the structure? So hopefully by now I've convinced you that uh, there are many things one can do with molecular dynamics, not just study um, chromosome structure. Um, and that, you know, I think in um, many cases, there are questions to, to be answered and, and those can be addressed in many, many different ways. This is just one of them. And so I'd like to thank Eugene Terentiev, my PhD advisor at Cambridge, and of course the Lucy Cavendish College for the kind invitation, and Jeannie Lee of Harvard and MGH, Carissa Sanborn Matsu of Los Alamos National Lab, and Maha of the Physics Department of Harvard, who have all been uh, working on, on this uh, with me. So um, now I'm happy to take, I know I went slightly over time, so I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, so please. Thank you, Anna, that was a lovely talk and the, the modeling is beautiful. Um, I will, I don't see any questions in the chat, but I'll, I'll kick things off because uh, that was fascinating and I, I have probably a hundred questions. So um, your, 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 es, your escapees in the, in the X chromosome that should be shut down is very interesting. How prevalent is that in, so in other words, is that, this is not in a disease setting, is it? No, no, no. This is just uh, kind of the, the regular wild type situation where, you know, a small fraction of genes, you know, and it's only you can literally number the, them, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's probably, I would say, around 10 uh, or so genes, maybe, maybe, you know, up to 20. I wouldn't say that it's more than that, but it's, it's an active field of research. So there is, there is, uh, yeah, but, but it's, um, it's something that you see in the wild type that's completely normal. So what is the line of thinking for why you have these? So I, I think I'm, I'm getting thrown off by the word escapees, mm -hmm. because what I'm thinking is, is if this is normal in the wild type setting, um, is there a space for requirement of gene expression of these genes from both chromosomes as opposed to just one? So I looked at DDX3X exist, for example, DDX3X is an RNA binding protein it's a critical gene. So is it that as opposed to being an escapee, it's actually an evolutionarily conserved mechanism that means that the X chromosome is that the other X chromosome is shut down, but you need, you require, um, you know, two copies of a gene to, to be expressed for some genes. Yes, absolutely. Yes. So I think the escapee just comes from, you know, it's, it's a historical term that simply is related to the idea that, you know, most of the genes are simply not active on the inactive X chromosome, hence the name. And I think that it, it is just kind of a, uh, a, a good way of saying that, yes, there are the most of the genes are inactive, but then there are some genes that do escape the inactivation. And so that, that's just historically how the name uh, kind of came to be. But this is a very, uh, yes, so from the evolutionary perspective, I, I totally agree that this must be a very important way to, you know, signal to the cell that everything is okay once you have two copies of that gene expressed. Yeah, and in Turner's syndrome, for example, this can't happen, and and that results in you know in a, in a whole bunch of things that go wrong. Uh, and and I think I think this is from the developmental perspective. This is a very yeah, this is very very exciting, and there's yeah, there's a lot of research that's that's going into these escapee escapees and and. Uh, uh, we're we're currently you know working on so for example exist and and the the exist RNA uh, that comes from that gene you know it's it's very it's very exciting research. And I promise just one last follow up question uh -huh. because this sure. is so interesting. Does the physical location of these chromosomes inside the nucleus affect whether you have escapees or not, or the um, or the shutting down of one of the X chromosomes? Does that matter at all? Is there anything known about that? 
Yes, yeah, so there, there are some indications that the inactive X tends to kind of go closer to the periphery of the nucleus, like it, it, it kind of like wants to go closer to the nuclear envelope. Uh, now, you know, it, there's no conclusive evidence because there are some times where you see under the microscope that, you know, the, the, the chromosomes are closer to the center, you know, but um, yeah, I, I don't think that it's, it's very well characterized at this moment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, there is a question in the chat. Um, hi, Anna. Thank you so much for that fantastic presentation. What is the most challenging and most rewarding part of your research um, slash project? From uh, Ella. Uh, <laughs> well, thank you for this question. Um, I, I love everything about it, you know, from the beginning till the end. I really love when I get the idea of, of what I want to work on and when it kind of becomes a project because there is this period of time where you have an idea that's really vague in your mind and you start thinking well how can I really kind of conceptualize it how, how do I put it into words and then once you've put it into words you can then start thinking about putting it into the simulation and then running that simulation and that is you know that pathway is what really excites me um you know from the time when i was you know even a high school student working on my synesthesia project i think the idea that came to me first was the most exciting moment because it, it's it's this realization that this is what i can do and and you think oh my god how can i do it but but you don't care because you think, well, you know, there must be a way. Maybe I don't know the way to do it right now. And it took me a while even to learn the programming language just to use the machine, you know, to, to, to take the experimental data from that EEG uh, apparatus and, and kind of transfer that into data. So it took me some, you know, some time to figure that out, but that, is what really brings me excitement. There's a lot of frustration that goes with that. And I'm sure that a lot of postdocs in the audience, uh, you know, and then PhD students and even undergraduates will realize that that's, that, that happens a lot. But I think the reward that comes afterwards where you realize I've managed to do this. You know, with the chromosome, I can tell you a very specific example of the chromosome because I had been working on a completely different project and, and Carissa and I were working on the one billion atom simulation, which at the time was kind of a crazy idea that Carissa had. And I kind of came into the project towards the end and I was working out uh, the paper and how to, uh, how to combine the results. So, you know, I was working on that. And at the same time, I just randomly get this idea, oh, this is the part of code that I just need to include to make the connection between experimental data and my models. And so that just came to me as I was driving, you know, there was, a, I lived in Santa Fe and Los Alamos was one hour away. So you drive one hour and you have a lot of time to think uh, during that drive. And that's when it came to me and I ran into my office and 15 minutes later, it was all done because I knew the part that where it needed to go. And that was just absolutely after that, I was like, well, OK, that's done now. And for me, that's where, you know, I'm not as interested in the problem anymore. I want more. I want something new. So it's always this search for excitement, search for something completely novel, something that people haven't done before, because that's what what brings me uh, most joy. I hope that answers the, the question. Um, thank you, uh, Anna. Um, another question. I really enjoyed your talk, uh, Anna. Thank you. As a mathematician, I find it fascinating that something as abstract as a not, as not theory is quoted by applied scientists studying stuff like chromosomes and gene expression. Have you actually worked with a mathematician, uh, with mathematicians in not theory? And if so, how has it worked out? 
Uh, well, thank you so much, Ursula, uh, for this question. And and Ursula used to be my tutor at at Cambridge. So uh, thank you for for asking this. You know, I absolutely love working with mathematicians, and it's a very for me it's very interesting how I have to translate the problem I have and the way I see it to the language of, of mathematics and, and how it is very complicated because I'm not always sure what, you know, of how to formulate the, the question. So I know, I, I also am aware of, of all these, you know, representations of knots and how a, a lot of people kind of in, in physics misuse the idea of not theory, you know, trying to describe something. And so I thought, well, you know, I'm not a mathematician, so I just have to go with the intuition that I have from physics to understand these phenomena that are very well known in mathematics. And so in mathematics, when you look at knots, you just kind of think of them as static structures and and what i you know what i feel um i can add to to this is is a kind of a level of of dynamics and these interactions uh that may take place say for example if you have like colloidal particles that are arranged in in a way that they're uh, forming a knot and so i think that Partially, my interest was in this dynamical transition, in, in, the, in the understanding of how to treat a mathematical construct as a physical entity. And, and it's something that is still work in, in, in progress. And I feel that there's a lot that I need to learn from the mathematicians. And if, uh, you know, if any one of you has any uh, advice on who may be best to contact, I would, I would love to hear from them because I'm, I'm absolutely fascinated. Um, so, you know, I, I've worked with uh, a number of applied mathematicians like, like Maha and, and some topology, uh, topologists. Um, and, and, you know, we're trying to come to an understanding and it's, it's still, you know, it's, it's work in progress. It, it's really interesting and exciting, but there needs to be something that kind of combines it all. And right now, I think we're kind of somewhere midway through uh, to, uh, you know, we're not there yet. I don't know if that, if that explains it, Ursula. Uh yeah, yes, it does. I, I wonder <laughs> if the, the language sometimes is a barrier. Between... Oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, I have a number of books um, on formal knot theory, you know, that, that I constantly uh, use as, you know, just, just regular reading, because that's what I require to be able to communicate with the mathematicians. And I think that, you know, for, you know, the, the communication otherwise, it's also a problem because we have to kind of integrate the idea of dynamics and the idea of something moving and, and the idea of, you know, these crossings being very kind of robust and, and how that changes into um, jamming, uh, you know, from just the topology itself. It's, it's not very clear how to go about that for in mathematical terms. So, yes, as I said, you know, if you uh, or anyone else has any, um, you know, has anyone who's interested in kind of in the applied side of knot theory, I'm more than happy to collaborate. Think about it, but that, that, that's great, the dialogue, it's how science moves. Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, there is another question in the chat. Uh, thank you very much for a very interesting and, in, uh, and engaging pre uh, presentation. I'm currently a student at college and sometimes I find it a bit daunting how much there is that's undiscovered. How did you know where to start in your field of research? Uh, this is an amazing question from a student. Wow. Oh, uh, there's a simple answer to this. You know, my feeling is that you just have to follow your heart. You really have to sit down and 
you know, maybe just read different papers. Just, you know, what, what I usually do is I go through a journal, say, you know, science or nature uh, or any other scientific journal, and, and I kind of skim through. And there will always be something that really kind of grabs your attention. And that is where I start, you know, and then it's, it's kind of like several layers of, of research that you need to do after. You start from just, oh, this is an interesting concept. You know, you can also look at, for example, you know, for me, I was always, like I said, you know, I was always interested in pattern formation and, and uh, the, the whole idea of how, for example, flocks of birds move together in a group where, you know, they're not really collectively thinking, yeah, we need to go that way. It just happens. And so for me, I think this idea of understanding patterns is where, you know, I would combine science and, and art because, because the two are inseparable. So often I personally get inspired by artists. There, there is uh, an artist in Santa Fe, um, his name is Aaron Karp, and I was so fascinated by his work that, you know, I knew that I had to meet him. And so I did, last time I visited Santa Fe, I uh, called him and he arranged a visit to, in, to his gallery. And I was just mesmerized by all the patterns that, that he came up with that look exactly like my simulations. And, you know, we talked about things. I told him about the Penrose tiles and he told me about the way he thinks about his work and how it happens. You know, he uses tape to mask structure and then kind of underlying structures just come about and it, it's absolutely amazing so you know i think what you need to do is to be open to all different possibilities and and once you are you know these ideas will just come and they won't you know there's no way you will be sitting nine to five and suddenly at 3 p.m you will find something new that's not how it works i think mostly it's these ideas that you suddenly wake up at three in the morning and you realize, oh, this is a thing I want to do. And then you go and you run your simulation or you, you know, you do your equation or mm, you, you, you go and do your experiments in the lab. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that a lot of postdocs and PhD students probably agree with this approach. And, and sometimes it doesn't work. Most of the times it, it doesn't work. But then one time, that it works. It's so rewarding that nothing else matters and all the failure that, that came before that, it's meaningless. So I think, you know, if that's kind of the way you approach science, then you're going to be happy no matter where you are or what you do. That's kind of my view on this. Um, hopefully that answers the question. <laughs> May I ask a follow up question on that? Absolutely. Because I, I agree, it's a really, really good question. Um, in, in the process of all of this and reading and, you know, you have this passion for finding patterns in nature and so on and so forth. Is there an overall question that you yourself have as a grander vision that you want to answer in your life that 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 links these things together? You know, I try not it's it's a very big yeah it's a very big problem i you know of course i you know want to develop a whole new theory of of the universe but but that's probably not what's going to happen you know so i i end up just kind of breaking it down into smaller problems and then i think over time what happens is that my mind starts kind of putting things together. So in 2009, when I was sitting in the library in Edinburgh, I didn't really think um, that, you know, many years later, you know, 10 years later, that this is what, what's going to happen, that I will eventually uh, build the model of, of a chromosome. I think what happened is that there were some events that took place that kind of accidentally led me to it. But it was almost like not quite an accident because clearly I knew some somewhere in the background that this was the problem I wanted to answer. And 
for me, I think the genome organization problem in, in general is a very interesting one, but it's not the only problem that I'm interested in. So I think once once that is solved and understood and the dynamics of the genome is more or less understood, which probably will take, you know, many, many years. Um, I think, I think just the general idea of how is there a pattern to pattern formation, you know, because there are so many different patterns that form, you know, not just Penrose tiles or these flocks of birds or schools of fish. There are so many and yet there is an underlying principle that we as humans recognize that it's a pattern. And so what is it that that kind of, you know, it's almost a philosophical question. I don't know, maybe I'll become a philosopher eventually, but but I, I do feel that, you know, this this kind of philosophical question, is there something that's ingrained in our mind that kind of makes us interpret the patterns the way we interpret them? rather than you know it it just being a universal thing so i really want to find out is it a universal thing to to have pattern or is it just something that we kind of recognize and and see and there's much more than than what we know already um yeah it's it's very complicated so so i i guess you know the 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 clean answer would be i don't have a you know point at which i want to be in 20 years time i'd rather say I'm just guided by, you know, some kind of intuition that hopefully will bring me to the right place, but it may not. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Anna. Uh, I think in the interest of time as well, uh, because there are no more questions in the chat Absolutely. as well, we'll probably yeah. stop the talk here. And just to say thank you so much for that lovely talk. That was fascinating. Um, and uh, yes, thank you very much. And thank you to everyone for attending and to see, uh, and we'll see everyone at the next Life from Lucy event. Thank, thank you again, you Anna. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you. I thank really you. appreciate it. And thank bye you. Bye-bye. See you later.